Evening, ladies and gents. My name is Simon Brown. I'm from JustOneLap.com and other places, but that is my key function and, and, and what I do these days. Doing this series of boot camps starting this evening, I'm going to kick into some detail. But what we're doing here this evening, and we'll do all the way through to June of next year, is ultimately a series of 12 uh, presentations. We're doing them live. We're doing them Periscope. We're doing them webcast. If there's technology, we love it. We love technology. Um, and we're going to take a journey. And we're going to start this evening really at point one. And I appreciate for some of you, point one is uh, you've, you're, you're beyond point one. You've moved on from that. Bear with me. We will catch up with you soon enough. Notwithstanding to that, my comment is always, if you leave here this evening with one or two points that resonates with you, that made sense and talked to you, we're winning. That's absolutely what the process is. You're not going to leave here with 50 things to implement. That's not how we as human beings work. It's not how our brains function. If you can take one or two things away from this evening, then we're absolutely winning and we're moving forward. Um, I need my doofa. I want to make sure that is doing everything it needs to do. Cool. So the first point is, why do we trade? And in fact, we were having that conversation, ah, there you are right there, um, just before we came. And I mean, why are we trading? And, and the answer I get most often from people is it's about money. We want to make money. And, and in truth, sure. I mean, of course, that's why we trade. It's why we get out of bed in the morning. It's why we have jobs and everything else. The problem with money as the answer is our relationship with money as hu human beings. And that is a bad relationship. I mean, think about idioms and, 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 and cliches around money. They're all negative. A fool in his money will soon be parted. Burn a hole in your pocket and so the list goes on. Um, we, 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 we sacrifice our long-term security for short-term flashness so that we can look like we've got money. And we intrinsically know, as human beings, every one of us knows that at our funeral, no one is going to stand up and read your bank balance. So we've got this absolutely tormented relationship with money, which is why my sense of trading is to not make it about money. And in truth, it can't be, because, and I'll come to that in a second. My point of trading is to make it around things I can control and things that don't cause me internal conflict and stress and everything else, which money does. So to me, why do we trade? We trade from, it's a cliched phrase, but it works, freedom from ties that bind. Which, which in a fancy way means you wake up in the morning and you go to work because you want to go to work, not because you have to go to work. And that's probably the absolute ideal. And everyone's going to have a different idea. For me, it's sitting on the beach, uh, you know, drinking red wine, relaxing, probably not in the midday sun drinking red wine, but nonetheless. Uh, and, and that's what I'm trying to get to. And what I focus on is the things I can control. My discipline, my responses to the market what I do trade and how I trade, rather than saying the whole purpose of this is money. The key point is, the, while we stay away from the focus on money is the fear, it's also what we can control. When you're in a trade, you can control a lot of things. You can control, did you buy it or not? Did you, you know, decide that this wasn't your trade? Where did you, where have you decided you will exit? You can decide the type of trader and the strategy you are. You can enforce your discipline and the like. Those are things we can control. And because we can control them, two things happen. A, we can do them and we get the positive reinforcement by doing them. As in an individual trade, we cannot control the money, the profit or the loss. If you do 100 trades, half make you money, half don't make you money, you can do every one of those trades perfectly well. But part of trading is that you do everything you can control well, you might still make a loss. So if we measure an individual trade by money, we run a hide into nothing because we're measuring ourselves by something we have no control over. Which is why, why do we trade? It's not money. Money is the byproduct of successful trading, and that then gives us freedom from ties that bind. But if the focus is money, we're in for pain and suffering. And we can see it in almost every incredibly wealthy person. You know, Larry Ellison started a company. His focus was to make a brilliant company, and by default, he made money. Uh, same with Bill Gates. Warren Buffett's process was to buy the best businesses and build a, a conglomerate, and the result of that, the outcome of that is making the money. 
Then comes to the question, so what is trading? So this is my favorite quote from Van K. Tharp, who, who is a risk management expert in the trading space, written a number of books. We don't trade the markets, we trade our beliefs about the markets. And what's critically important here is it is about beliefs, or put another way, it is about biases. Our belief structures heavily inform who we are and everything we do. Of course they do. But they do that in trading at the same time. And I'll give you an example. <clears throat> if you believe the end of the world is coming, the end of the financial system, and that this whole QE is a crock of nonsense and it's going to collapse in a complete heap, and that we are going to have a financial crisis that will make 1929 look like a, a Sunday picnic, and I show you a picture of a gold chart, you will find me five reasons why you should buy it. Not because you're looking at the gold chart with clean eyes, but because you're looking with the gold chart through your lens of, well, the world ends, gold goes up. I mean, in truth, the world ends, the price of water and the price of pumpkin seeds, that goes up. I don't want your gold bar. Hey, my water and pumpkin seeds have got real value. But it's those belief structures that we have. Now, old school thinking around trading, when I say old school 10, 15 years ago, was uh, we must remove our beliefs. We must trade without belief. We can't. We're human beings. Behavioral finance has taught us that we can't just say, you know, try and be a robot. It's, we, we are unable to do that. So what we now say to the process is, okay, great. We have to understand our beliefs. We have to realize them. We have to know what they are and we have to accept that they exist and that we can live with them. And what we do is we design our trading, we design our processes that in essence remove the biggest risk to our trading. That biggest risk, me, you, the individual, the trader. Why? Because we have biases, because we do silly things, because we have silly beliefs. So we create structure. You know, if you watch the movies, what are the traders doing or the TV shows? They're sitting in front of a computer, you know, screaming orders, buy this, sell that. There's no structure. It's complete chaos. And, and that kind of attracts us. In truth, the good traders, it's structure. It's about that structure. And that's the process. And I'm going to come back to these repeatedly at the end of the session this evening. I'll give you some homework, some thoughts to go and think about and, and things to, to, to challenge yourself for, for the session uh, when we kick off again in, in August. The point being is, is that what we're going to do over the next 12 months to June of next year is fit into that, is come to that point where we have structure. The videos will be available. They'll be on the IG website. They'll be on our website. So you can go back to them because that's the other point. You don't do a session and move on. You revisit. You go back. You, you know, no one's here that young, so we remember matric exams. I didn't study for them, but I'm sure the people who did study for them, the process was repeatedly the study process. And that's what we're doing here. And it's going to be a journey, and it's going to take time. How much time is how long is a piece of string? Some people, it might be measured in, in months. Some people, for me personally, it took five years before I was a profitable trader consistently over time. I blame it on the fact that back in the 1990s, there wasn't internet and, and, and IGs and stuff like that. It's probably a lame excuse. It's the best one I've got. Um, in truth, I'm probably just a slow learner. But it's going to be that process. So the first point is volatility. Volatility, and there's the, the, the definition, the degree of variation of a trading price series over time, which is a fancy way of saying things go up and things go down. What we, can, what we can't do and what trading is never about, we can't predict the future. We, our ability to predict the future is exactly the same as Simon Gear, the weatherman. He's, 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 he's poking in the dark, to be perfectly honest. And what they've done is make it look fancy and charts and stuff like that, but uh, they, they don't get it terribly right. No one has an ability to predict the future. What volatility is, is that prices go up and down. The issue is by how much and by what speed. And intuitively, we look at this and we think, ha ha, we want the ones that go up crazy amounts in double quick time. Because we're in a hurry. We want to be rich by Friday, Friday morning, because I got plans for the afternoon. The problem with those 
assets. And I'm going to talk assets and I'll delve into the, the separate pieces in a moment. The problem with the different assets and the volatility, the high volatility assets, and you can spot them because they're just doing this. The problem with those is that if we're on the right side, brilliant, boom. But there's two sides to every coin. In other words, we can make money in a hurry. But what happens if we're on the wrong side of the trade? And suddenly we lose money in a hurry. Now, optimism bias says we'll always be on the winning side. We're special. Our mothers told us. And our mothers weren't wrong. But in the trading space, you're going to win a lot, you're going to lose a lot. Uh, a, a good trader has a win ratio, in other words, a profitable to, 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 to losing trade ratio of maybe 55%. And if they get it into the high 50s, they're doing spectacular. I know successful traders who make profit, who have a win ratio in the 30%. Because when they win, they win 10 rand. And when they lose, they lose one rand. So they don't, you know, three winners, seven losers. They come out ahead of the process. What we need to do is to actually pull back and say, you know what? Yes, it's really great when things go crazy and suddenly they move. And it's a wonderful feeling. And I've been there literally in 15 years of trading, a few times in my trading career, I've been in a position where something happens, some piece of news breaks, and whatever I'm holding suddenly jumps up 20 or 30%, and it is you know, caviar and champagne for dinner tonight. And fortunately, I have in very few instances been on the other side of the coin, but I have been on the other side of the coin. But in reality, if we're aiming for the volatility, it cuts both ways. So we've got to say to ourselves, what do we trade? What is the, the ideal product that we should look at? Or we're not even getting to product yet. What is the ideal underlying that we trade? And in this day and age, I, mean, I, I take the view that anything is tradable. If you can move it, you can trade it. And in truth, if you can't move it, you can probably still trade it. You know, someone could buy a table mountain and you know, just charge a fee to go and have a look at it every day or something. So anything is tradable. I obviously going to focus on 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 the, on the fairly obvious is in a sense the shares, the commodities, the indices, currencies, and I put Bitcoin there just because it fascinates me and because I own two. And if the end of the world comes and I can find my keychain, I'll be very proud of them. I don't know I'll be able to do anything with them, but nonetheless. So we start right at the top: shares, equity, stocks. Call them what you will. We know them. They're the NAS passes of the world. Excuse me, the BHP bulletins, the pick and pays, the Curos, the Advertex. They're listed uh, on exchanges around the world in South Africa. They're listed on the JSC in London. They're listed on the LSC, New York, NASDAQ, Hong Kong, Tokyo, and so the list goes on. There's probably a, around 100, 120,000 listed companies across the world. Many of them not accessible because they, for example, in China and we can't access the Chinese market directly. But there's about a, there's certainly about 100,000 of them, which for an individual trader is approximately 99,995 too many. And it's part of what I talk about in that discipline of trading is that we look at 100,000 shares and we think, brilliant, we'll trade them all. We need to become experts. We need to become an absolute expert in a fairly narrow field. When I used to try and trade 40 stocks, I had 40 shares on my list, and I would try and trade all 40 of them. And the reality is you just can't do it. Your brain just, you know, your brain just gives up. You also don't potentially have the capital to do 40 transactions at any one given time. So we start with shares, we then move to commodities, your gold, your platinum, your oil, your uh, soft commodities, uh, uh, grains, maize, pork bellies, lumber, etc., etc. Um, again, if it moves, it's tradable. And what you're seeing with commodities is it really is a futures product. What I mean by that, a future pricing product. It really was designed for the farmers or the, the lumberjacks or whoever the case may be. What they needed was a way to secure a price. So the way they would work was if I buy a share and I buy it from you and we agree on a price, I give you 1,600 Rand for your NASPAS, you give me the NASPAS, I'm now an owner of that NASPAS. What a, a commodity has traded is <clears throat> the prices are moving. And if you look at gold, there was a price of gold, platinum, it's just dropped below 1,000. What the, the logic behind it was that you're a farmer and you've got a hectare of maize and you want security of, of what, what you will receive for it. 
So you go to somebody else and say, I will deliver this maze to you in six months' time. Can we agree on the price now? And you both take risk because you don't know what the price will be in six months' time. In truth, what we're looking at is the current price. In other words, what it is transacting at in this moment in time. So yes, there's a, a forward market in, in gold. Um, there's a forward market in all, in all of the commodities. What we're looking at in commodities is the gold price as it transacts right now, much as a NASPAS share would. We move to indices. I'm a huge fan of indices. An index is a basket. It's top 40 index in South Africa, largest 40 shares on the JSC. There are about 450 shares. It is the largest 40. So it includes your telcos, your banks, a uh, bunch of your retailers, also includes a bunch of mining companies, logistics, British American Tobacco, your SAB Millers and the like. The key point with an index is that we use them for tracking a market and you will find many different types of indices. So in South Africa, top 40 is the 40 largest stocks. We've also got a, an Indy 25, which is the 25 largest industrial shares, Finney 15 the 15 largest financial stocks. We go overseas, the well-known one is the Dow Jones. Uh, the 30, and they're no longer, so the Dow Jones started life as an industrial index, has moved on from that. Um, but the 30, and it's not even necessarily the largest 30, the Dow Jones does a weird methodology, I'm not gonna touch on it. But we know the Dow Jones, S&P 500, FTSE 100, which is the London Exchange 100 largest, and so it goes on. And I'm very, very big fan of those. I'm going to come back to them in a moment. Currencies, FX, Forex, call it what you will. Pros and cons to Forex. I'll come to the pros in a moment. I'll come to the cons in a moment. We all get currency markets. We've either got one or two expectations of currency markets. You've either seen the advert on um, Facebook, some dodgy person who's telling you, and they don't look dodgy. I mean, they look all swick and Swank, but they're telling you that they made $1,200 before their second cup of tea today. Yeah, it, it, so why are you on Facebook if you're making so much money? Why don't you have a life and go out on the beach and buy champagne and caviar and stuff? The other experience we have is that we tried Forex and we are poorer for the experience. I tried Forex, got the t-shirt, lost the t-shirt. And it's the two extremes. In truth, and it's a, re it's a recent realization for me, there's some serious significant advantages to Forex. We'll come to those in a bit, so I'll park that there for now. And then, as I said, Bitcoin, just because it fascinates me and because it's so different. What do we want to do as a trader? Is trade uncorrelated. You don't want to trade Anglo and Billiton. They're the same thing. Standard Bank and First Rand, same thing. They're bankers. Will one do better than the other? Sure. But they're the same thing. What do you want to trade? You want to trade US dollar, euro, and SA40, boom, those are not the same thing. I mean, if the world collapses, they're both gonna have a tough time, but in truth, they'll go different directions potentially. But you wanna trade things that don't go in lockstep. Because if you're trading things that move the same, well, then you're just duplicating your trade. You're duplicating your risk. So let's run through volatility, shares, high volatility. Shares are the highest volatility thing we're going to trade, always. Simple reason. So yesterday, Kiro says, so no, yesterday, Advertech says, Kiro's not buying us. Stock goes down 5%. This afternoon, Kiro says, hey, no, 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 we are buying you. Well, stock goes up 5%. Now, intuitively, we say brilliant. So we could have made 5% yesterday and make 5% today. In truth, what does that really mean? We probably got whipsawed. What we want to do as a trader, traders come and they say, I want to be a day trader. I want to do 100 trades a day. Mind-numbingly, brain-destroying, soul-crushing existence. Trust me, being there, no fun. What do you want to be? A lazy trader. We don't want to spend our days in front of a computer screen watching charts and trading. Now, my target, I was saying just before we came in, you know, I, I'm trying to get my trading down to about 25 trades a year, two a month, one every fortnight. The problem with frequency of trade is that every time you trade, you pay transaction fee, you cross the spread, the spread is that difference between the buy price and the sell price. So you've got a buyer at a rand, you've got a seller at a rand and two cents. 
you buy at a random two cents. If you were to sell immediately, you've lost two cents. So the frequency, as you increase that frequency of trade, what happens? Your costs increase. So what we actually want to do is try and trade less. So that idea that, okay, so yesterday we could have been short on Cura, in other words, making money on the downside, sorry, Advertech, we would have made some banks some profit. And then we would have gone long and we would have made money on the upside today and banked some profit. That's the theory. The practice, we probably got whipsawed all over the place. We probably got kicked out more times than we can count. You want to get in that trade and ride it for as long as possible. The best trade in the world is the one that you entered three years ago and you're still there. Why would you be in a trade after three years? Because it's been making profit for three years. And shares are volatile. You know, if you if you have a look at the top moving shares, and don't I mean don't look at the small and the mid caps, look at those top 40, the biggest stocks in our market. If you look at those shares, they are moving, you know, the top movers up are doing two, three, four percent in a day. The top movers down are doing two, three, four percent down in a day. Within that, it could be even wider. In other words, the stock was down six percent but closed three percent down on the day. Those are massive moves. Those are huge moves. And if you then put gearing on top of it, and I'll come to gearing in a moment, those are moves that are almost impossible to, 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 to manage from a trading perspective. Whereas you go to commodities, your volatility pulls down. I, I'm not a huge fan of trading commodities. I'll come to that in a moment. You go to indices. When last did our index do a 2% move in one day? October last year. I know. I was on the wrong side of it. Trust me. I remember that. It was my birthday too. Hey, stuff happens. When last did a top 40 share do a 2% move in a day? Well, five of them did today. So if we get that trend and we get on the top 40 bus, and it's not always going to be plain sailing. I was saying before we came in, at the moment, this is a particularly tough market to be trading. Because pretty much we hit an all-time high in 4th of July last year. We had a new high in around uh, May-ish. But pretty much from over the last year, our market has gone pretty much nowhere. And what do we want? We want a market that goes up or down, not nowhere. Nowhere is not a market we can make money in. We need, we need movement. We just need controlled movement. So what we see with indices is because they're less volatile, because they fly around less, when they start moving in a direction, you can stay in the trade for longer. And if you stay in the trade for longer, two things happen. Your costs go down because you don't have frequent transacting. And your profits go up not only because your costs have gone down, your profits go up because quite simply, well, the thing's going somewhere. And intuitively, around the world, aside from the funny uh, uh, FX adverts, which which... I'll come to it in more detail in a moment. Where do we start trading? We go to shares as our first port of call. We go to shares because, you know, if, you're, if, you're, if, you learn, if your parents were involved in the market, they probably knew shares. If you've got friends, you, uh, the JSC is an easy and accessible. Getting a stockbroker account to trade JSC shares, whether geared or ungeared, is quite simple and, 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 and a relatively easy process. We know these shares. Now, I say... You know, Absa, Willys, ShopRite. Oh, yeah, I know those companies. It makes us feel more comfortable. I say Aussie or SA40 and you're like, um, I don't know what you mean. So we like, we, we gravitate towards the shares. In truth, what we have done is move to the more volatile and ergo more risky part of the market. I'm not saying we don't trade shares. I'm saying we've, we've jumped in in the deep end. And there's pros and cons to that, but nonetheless. And then we get to FX. And FX currencies are actually low volatile. And I stress here, I'm talking the majors. So I'm not talking, you know, Rand Swiss Franc. Man, Rand Swiss Franc is just a, a hiding waiting to happen. The majors, dollar, euro, Japanese yen, sterling. The attraction with them. So if the euro goes from 110 versus the dollar to 108 versus the dollar, uh, the, the talking heads are going to be talking for days and weeks and months afterwards. 
it's moved 2%, and that's a, a massive move, and it probably will happen over, I mean, maybe hours, but under normal circumstances, it'll happen over days and weeks. The problem with is we take too much gearing. I'm still coming to that point, and that's why we explode. That's why I bust out. So I started trading FX many, many moons ago. I had $2,000, um, and I took a position that was for $200,000. I didn't know what I was doing, and I took my risk level and just maxed it as much as I could. Why? Optimism bias. I'm special. I'm not going to bust out. I'm going to make so much money, I won't know what to do with it. I survived three and a half days. And I was probably lucky to make it that far. So in truth, your FX is your lowest volatility. Bitcoin, I mean, I put variable because I go look at a Bitcoin chart, and it just depends. I mean, there are times when Bitcoin looks like it's dead. And there are times when Bitcoin looks like it's falling off a cliff or going up and elevate. And what we need to do is say, okay, we get that. We understand the volatility. We understand the risk and the volatility. We understand the, 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 the concerns about it. How do we manage it? And I want to delve into each of those individually. But questions on that. Questions particularly around the volatility and understanding and, and, and what volatility means and its implication. I hear what you say, and it's a great point. So there are a couple of issues. Firstly, I'm not even talking about the RAND. The RAND is volatile. It's a minor. I'm not talking about the Swiss franc, which moved 40% in a day. That's crazy. If you, but, and I'm, not, I'm talking about the base level. So, so, I mean, the euro, when it listed... And my mind has gone blank. But if you look at the euro, which came into existence in 1999, and you look at it over a 16-year period, it's traded in a relatively small band, you know, maybe 40 or 50 percent, which is a lot, but not for 15 years. So if the euro is 109 tonight versus the dollar, tomorrow it might be 110, it might be 108, it's not going to be 115. And, and that's now the rand is currently 1237, and tomorrow it could be six, it could be 15. But the euro is, is significantly less volatile. The point is we put the gearing on, but I'm going to come to that point. So I said already, we want uncorrelated. Why do we want uncorrelated? Because you want the trades to operate independently of each other. You want there to be different drivers to your different trades. So some trades will be driven by, if you're trading agriculturals, will be driven by rainfall. Other trades will be driven by the politics in Europe and, and is or isn't Greece going to be expelled from the European Union. Others will be driven by company news flow. Others will be driven by broader economic news flow within a particular territory. And if you've got all those different things happening, a single event is not going to necessarily the, the big risk is, is that a, 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 a what we call a black swan event, which was the collapse of Lehman Brothers. In, in back in uh, 2008. If you didn't have an uncorrelated portfolio and you were fully exposed, the collapse of Lehman Brothers is really, really painful. But you also want different drivers because sometimes the drivers fade away. You know, suddenly Greece is off the radar again. It will be back, but for now, no one talks about Greece anymore. So we want those uncorrelated. Don't fall into the trap. And I've done fallen into this trap. So there is a formula that you can do for correlation. You take two sets of prices, you run them through Excel, you square them, and you get a number between minus one and plus one. Plus one is correlated. They move in lockstep. Minus one is inversely correlated. They move opposite each other. And zero is, they don't know who they are, they're chaos. The problem with that is, is that it depends on your time frame. In other words, so if you're going to take, for example, so I did the exercise on the South African market, SA40, and the European markets, uh, DAX, London, Kakaron, I think just those three. And the first answer came back and said, we are closest matched to France, which was weird, but whatever. Numbers don't lie. But then I changed my time frame. That was over a three-year period. Then I did it over a five-year period. We were closest matched to, to, to Germany. I, I, whatever time frame I, I, I picked, I got different answers. What are we doing there? We're running the risk of, of picking a certain time frame and deciding that is the truth. I could have stopped after my first set of data research 
and said, our, our relationship is closest to France. In other words, don't trade France and South Africa, trade South Africa and Germany because they're different. So I could have stopped at that single data point and said, well, oh, here's the truth. With any truth, anything that you believe, interrogate it again and again and again. And I don't mean go and check that your numbers are right. Do that, obviously. But go look at different time frames. Go look at different data sets. Don't look at the last five years. Look at 1995 to 2000. Pick a different five-year window. And most times, what ultimately comes out, there's very little truth. It depends on your bias to your time frame. So my bias was quite simple. Firstly, I chose European exchanges. Secondly, I chose a three-year period. And thirdly, I went from the current date backwards. And those are three biases. Those three decisions influence the outcome of the data. And at the end of the process of the exercise, and I spent a whole weekend doing it, at the end of the exercise, the answer was quite simple. Don't bother measuring correlation. Correlation is important, but that measurement of correlation is meaningless to us. Because in essence, we're going to influence it. So at the end of the weekend, if I wanted to decide what was the closest correlated, I had to make decisions on time frames and all of that. And, and, and that then is, is I'm bringing my biases into it. So what do we look for? To my sense, we want to trade some shares, some indices, some FX. You will notice what's missing is commodities in Bitcoin. Bitcoin for no good is, is missing for no good reason. I mean, trade Bitcoin. You know, treat it like anything else. Commodities, I've, I've just never, and maybe it's a personal bias. No, it's without a shadow of a doubt a personal bias. Maybe it's a personal bias that I should learn to discard. Um, I've just always traded commodities indirectly, i.e. via the company. So I don't trade gold. I will trade a gold miner. I've never traded a gold miner, but I would do it that way. Um, and there's, there's, there's certainly when I was coming through the, the ranks of, of learning to trade, our options were gold or platinum. Uh, and that was it. We've got much wider options today. And there's certainly a lot to be said for the different. I mean, look what's happened to oil. You know, the movements in oil gone from, from 120 to 60 or 50 or wherever it is in the last year and some change. Typically, when we call them mixed volatility, over a longer period, they're fairly volatile. Your, 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 uh, 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 a lot of your, your base metals, your aluminiums and the like, less so. You're sort of your second tiers. But certainly your golds, your platinums, your majors, your, your oil, they're fairly volatile. So you want to trade three. And, and what you don't want, and I said it earlier, I used to watch, I used to trade 40 shares. In truth, I wasn't trading 40 shares. I was giving my money away via 40 shares. I was better off buying wine or giving it to charity. Um, but actually, what you really want is to pick two or three shares, two or three indices, two or three FX pairs. So you're trading between six and nine instruments. You may have three or four live trades at a moment. Two or three is better. Why? A couple of reasons. Firstly, you become experts in them. Think if you trade, if you pick three shares, three indices, and three FX pairs, and we go forward five years' time, and that's all you have traded for five years are those nine different products, those nine different underlines. You're the expert. And I'm not saying you're the expert that you know what the balance sheet of, of ShopRite is or that you know what drives US dollar euro. But you start to get an intuitive feel for how they work and you've got your technical analysis, you've got charts that go back years, you've got experiences. When something's happening, you can draw on a past experience and say, hang on a second, I've been here before. What did I do last time? Did, did what I do last time, was it the right thing or the wrong thing? And we can learn from that process. And three or four trades, although it sounds like you're going to say three or four trades, that's not very... Three or four trades is a lot of trades in the market. That's a lot of data being flung at you. That's a lot of stress and pressure, particularly when we're starting. A lot of excitement and euphoria when we're making money and a lot of depression and tears when we're not. And as human beings, we have this insane belief that we can multitask. Our ability to multitask is zero. It just isn't. I mean, the, the research is out there. I mean, so I did the experiment. I used to have... At 1.6 screens on my desk, 
then it was four, then it was two, and then I now have a single screen in my desk. And the most productive I ever am is when I shut down everything except that single thing I'm working on. So when I'm working on this PowerPoint in the last uh, uh, two weeks or so and putting it together, if I want to do it well, I close everything down. I even put my phone on silent. And everyone in this room intuitively says, hmm, that makes sense. None of us are saying, no, 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 really, really, really. You know what? I can drive my car, make coffee, and write a report all at the same time. We think we are under time pressure. In truth, we are under time pressure. That's, we could make the argument it's self-imposed, but I'm going down a rabbit hole, so I'll park that there for now. We can generate... We can create profits. And I, I keep on. My, my, the, the example I'm going to use repeatedly over the next 12 months is Garth McKenzie because he trades in public and because very, very few people. I mean, he goes on TV and trades in public. I mean, that, 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 now, when I say it's a rarity, it's a rarity. CNBC, global, no one on that channel trades in public. Garth is doing what the biggest financial TV channel in the world doesn't do. Garth McKenzie does it. He is... Goth is a special oak. Make no bones about that. He's a braver oak than me too. But none, the point is he's doing well. Um, and he'll have, at times, three or four live trades is probably his upper limit. And that, that probably excludes his fancy option strategies he sometimes puts on. But he never comes into studio with Julieta and, I've got 12 trades. No, never. Three or four. So let's delve into the different underlyings. Shares. High volatility. Single news event can move them. Anglo-Americans got results on Friday. I have no idea what the results will be. They will be terrible, but what they are is not important. What is important is what are they relative to expectation. Everyone expects them to be terrible. On Tuesday, Kumba published terrible results, cut their dividend to zero, and went up. Yeah, that's just like, where's the sense in that? If you're looking for sense, do not look to the stock market. There is lots of chaos and madness. That's why we love it. The point is that a single news event can move it. That's very hard to manage from a trader's perspective. We don't know when the news event is coming. We don't know if it's good or bad. I remember when Austin or Mittal, remember they had that contract with Kumba to supply iron ore to them, and they forgot to sign the contract, to, to sign the renewal of the contract. And they came to the market one day and said, oops, we are canceling trade in this share. When they finally reopened trade in the share about three weeks later, it opened 30% lower. How do you manage that as a trader? Short answer, you don't. My response is simple. I don't trade shares. And in truth, there's two reasons. One is a compliance reason. When I'm on, yeah, I disclose my portfolio. It's on my, my vanity website, simonbrown.coza. And... What I don't, you know, when I go on TV, if I'm talking about discovery, I will say I own discovery. I don't want to also have to then be talking about discovery and say, look, I own it, but I'm also short. So I just said I'm going to move away from shares. But I also moved away from shares because of that. I mean, Gajima. So I held Gajima. It was a wonderful stock. It was trading at 110 cents. I'm at the airport in Cape Town. My flight is taking off at 10 to 9. And I get an SMS saying Gajima's just announced they've lost their Who Am I online contract. That's a billion year revenue for a company that has a billion year revenue, sorry, billion rand of revenue every year. So what do I do? I phone the, the, the trading desk because I'm not going to be in the air because the market opens at nine. Where's Gajima going to open? Not a clue. I phone the trading desk. I sell, sell my Gajima. They say, what price do you want to sell it at? It's like, whatever price you get. So I got 83 cents. Been a buck 10, I got 83 Split adjusted, it delisted the other day for 0 0.002 cents equivalent. That's not important to the point, but a single, small, insignificant event. Now, the point is, don't go and trade second tier stocks. Trade top 40 shares. Because if, 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 if Standard Bank loses a big contract, I mean, they don't have a contract that is, there's probably not a single contract of Standard Bank that's even 1% of their revenue. They lost a billion dollars of aluminium in, in, in China, and they're just kind of like, yeah, it's not nice, but what the heck, they carry on going. So you want to trade the big guys, the top 40 shares, and you want to, 
and, and, and the question is, I mean, maybe you're going to say, I don't want to trade shares. It's a decision I've made. And I stress at this point, and I'll come back to it repeatedly. Just because it's what I do doesn't mean it's what you need to do. Trading is an individual game. For me, shares, I don't like the risk. I, there's a disclosure issue for me because of my public profile. But that single news event can work in your favor. When the beers got taken out by Anglo, I happen to be holding it. Suddenly, a share I own goes up 30% in half a minute. That's wonderful. When Edcon got taken out, I was minutes away from going short, which meant I would have lost 30% in a matter of minutes. The other trick is what's your spreads and what's your liquidity. You manage, so liquidity is the amount of trade going through. You want high liquid. A spread costs you money. So how do you want a tight spread? How do you make that work? High liquidity. If you're trading top 40 shares, you've got liquidity. The low liquid top 40 shares are doing 10, 20 million a day on a slow day. The high liquid shares, MTNs and ASPASs and like on a big day will do three or four billion rand. That's serious liquidity in that process. And then go for different sectors. So you don't trade first round in ABSA, you trade first round BHP Bulletin, Richmond, and ShopRite. Are they all JC stocks? Yes, they're all South African companies. They have varying degrees of international exposure. And if we enter a bear market and everything's going down, all four of them will go down, albeit at different speeds and rates. But if the banking sector gets it, you've only got one bank. If the consumer's under pressure, you've only got one consumer stock. And what do you watch? What do you keep your eye on? You keep your eye on specific company and sector news. So you watch the company, but you watch the sector. You set up a watch list. You set alerts onto your phone that as news is being broadcast around, not just so if you're trading ABSA, you also want to watch the other banks. Because yes, I mean, only one bank lost a billion dollars of aluminium, but if, if, if bad debts start rising in one of the banks, it's probably going to happen in the other three. So it can give you a bit of forewarning. So you're watching very much company specific. You're watching results. You're watching sense announcements around that company, around that sector. And that is your morning coffee read. You get the business day. Okay, that's very old fashioned. You log on to the internet. And you go to the business day. Hey, I still get the business day. I'm trying to cancel it. And I just, I can't, I can't push the button. And it says, don't send me a dead tree every morning. It's like, I love my dead tree every morning. I don't read it most days, but it must be there. It's like a, it's like a teddy bear for, for my, my nephew. So your, your morning coffee is what stocks are you in? Go check what they've done. Set up RSS feeds. Go look at the stocks, go look at the peers, go look and see what's happening in that particular space, what's happening to markets. And that is, you, you've got to be right there at the coalface because it's, you know, you, 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 if you're not, you're going to miss it. Indices, low volatility, nice trends. And at the moment, our market is, is, well, it is trending. It's trending sideways, which is a terrible thing, within a fairly wide range, but it's going sideways. But if we go back the period, if we go back to the crisis of 08, 09, there was a beautiful trend. I mean, we fell off a cliff, but it was a beautiful trend. It was just going down. 2009 through to about 2013, 14, trend was straight up. Further back in time, 2003 to 2007, beautiful trend that goes up. Be very careful of strong trending markets where you do incredibly well and you start to think that you're the smartest person in the world. You are, with respect, trading in an easy market. A strongly trending market is easy. And it's going to lull you into a self-sense of confidence. And when you're not looking, it's going to whack you in the back of the head, take your money. Promise. You get great spreads. So in here, avoid major global indices. Avoid Europe and USA. Why? Because U USA catches a cold. Right, sorry, USA sneezes, we catch a cold. They too, you want to go almost to the sub ones. The ones that I like, the, to me, the, in, the markets to trade. DAX, Nikkei, which is Japan, SA40, which is local. Correlation, very weak. We've got South Africa, which is, well, we you know, South Africa. We've got Japan, which is, well, Japan, but it's Asia, so it's slightly different. It's also a very, very mature economy. And then we've got Germany, 
which is in the heart of Europe and the powerhouse of Europe. So you've got three really nice, diverse... And look, in 2008, they all did the same thing. Went down. But under normal circumstances, if you trade in those three, they're different. They're going to move in different paces. We saw the DAX rush up a year or so ago to 12,000 and then collapse down to 9,000, um, which is really lacquer for traders. It's nice moves. We can make money out of those. And all the while that was happening, Japan was roaring higher and we were going sideways. So we've got the perfect trio. They're doing different things. And what do you watch for this? You watch overall financial markets and you watch front page news. So if there is a something bad in Germany, I don't want to, uh, Fukushima in Japan. So Fukushima happens in Japan, that's on the front page, but it hits their market. So you're watching the front page news as much as economic. And you don't care about company specific. There are 225 shares in the Nikkei. They're 40 here and the DAX is, DAX is 40. You don't worry about the company. I trade the DAX. Do I know what stocks are on the DAX when I'm honest? What? I thought I could think of one. I can't even think of uh, BMW. Surely BMW is in there. <coughs> it's not important. It doesn't bother me. FX, your lowest volatility. There are two problems slash risks with FX. First, don't go mad on gearing. Gearing is amplification of the move. So you can go and trade 100 times geared, which means a 1% move makes or loses you 100%. You're better off going to the casino, putting the money on red, because at least they'll give you free drinks. The other point with, with FX is go carefully into it. Because, for example, uh, JP Morgan, they take their best traders and they say, go trade FX. They don't put their best traders on equity or commodity or they say go trade FX. So you're trading against the best. So gently, gently, slowly, slowly ease your way into FX. Do not jump into that pool. There are shocks and more than you can punch in any one afternoon. You get wonderful trends. You get trends that can run for years. Why? Because what's driving it? It's the front pages. It's the big picture news. Yes, it's economies and the like. But if, if Europe's, you know, Europe's been struggling for, for um, some would say forever, but certainly since 2008, America kind of came back on stream about four years ago. So in the euro dollar, we've just had this trend. It's gone for years. Yes, within the trend, as you zoom in, there's noise. But when you zoom out, it's just this amazingly beautiful trend that's just been going on for years and years. Because the two, you know, German, Europe is not going to suddenly wake up tomorrow and be a fixed economy. It's going to take years to fix that economy, as it did in America. And equally so, America is not going to wake up tomorrow and be a broken economy. Donald Trump was standing. Um, and understand it's a 24-7 market, which has implications. In truth, during the night... Our night, the FX market is fairly quiet. Now, America's closed. Europe's closed. Australia's not yet awake. It, it's a fairly quiet market. The most activity happens when New York is awake and when London is awake. So you don't have to be sitting there at 3 o'clock in the morning. And here's a top tip. If you're sitting at 3 o'clock in the morning watching Bloomberg and watching the screen, can I be respectful and suggest that you get a life? Maybe. Maybe get a book. So let's quickly touch on some, some, some gearing. So those are the different assets that we can trade. If you go back to that screen there, and you'll see I focused on shares, which I don't trade, but which is a natural default to us. I focused on indices. I focused on currencies. Those are certainly what I suggest the space to look at. And we talked around the whys and the hows and what to look for and how to variance them out. Then I quickly want to touch on, on because what we've been talking there is, is you, know, you buy the share. And in truth, how do you buy an index? Well, you can't buy an index. You've got to go buy a derivative product, the CFD, contract for difference. So let's quickly touch on CFDs. They are geared instruments. What that means is that if the underlying asset, the index, the commodity, the currency, whatever it might be, moves 1%, you will make or lose multiples of 1%, depending on that level of gearing. It adds risk, 
it adds reward. And I pointedly say risk first. Because every brain, because we're optimists, we, have, we, we, we suffer from optimism bias. We have to. As a species, if we weren't optimistic, we would still be in the caves. So I'm trying to push back on the bias. I will always say risk before I say reward. You will always think reward before you say risk. And in truth, when I think it, I think reward first. And then I go, oh, but hold on, hold on, say risk first. I'm trying to hack my brain. So far, so bad. What I mean by that margin. So you go and you say, I want 25,000 rand of discovery shares. Disclaimer, I own discovery. You want 25,000 rand of discovery shares. But instead of paying 25,000 rand, your CFD provider says to you, you pay margin, you pay a deposit. You pay 5,000 rand. What does that mean? That you're still making profit on that 25,000. If that goes up, you make the profit, but you've only put down 5,000. So your gearing is 25 divided by 5 is 5. So if that share moves 1%, you make 5%. Unless it goes down, in which case you lose 5. So here's the crunch. Let's look at this one first. Share, 100 Rand. CFD, 100 Rand. Same price. Typically, CFD is cheaper transaction fee. That's the attraction to them and the gearing. You buy 250 shares or you buy 250 CDs. So, sorry, CFDs. At this point, you're exactly the same. The difference is how much you pay. You pay 25,000 for the shares. On a CFD, you pay a 5,000 Rand deposit. That doesn't mean that you then go and buy 1,250 shares. Please. I, well, because you've got no wiggle room. I'm going to talk about that in the next one. But nonetheless, your exposure is exactly the same in both. And th this is important. That is your exposure. If this stock tomorrow, you wake up and the shares at zero, you've lost 25,000 Rand. Your broker is phoning you and saying, you owe me 20. Please send ASAP. And they don't take Bitcoin. You've got gearing of one. In other words, 1% is 1%. You've got gearing of five. So example. The stock moves 10%. Very nice. 10% move. What do we get? That's 10 Rand. So both parties make the same profit, 2,500. Because you both had 250 shares. The difference is one of you paid 25,000 for 2,500, so you made 10%. The other one paid 5,000 for 2,500, you made 50%. I can flip this and make those numbers minus, and I can make you lose 50% just as easy. This is what we're doing in the CFD space. I'm going to spend a little more time on CFDs. There is a ton of information at IG.com. There's a ton of information on just one lap.com around CFDs. We're going to delve into them in more depth in future presentations as well. But this is typically how we are trading, because we're doing shorter term because we are looking at, 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 at smaller moves. You know, we don't want to buy Capitec and hold it for 15 years with the CFD. I mean, if we could, we would love it. And there's issues around costs and the like. But we buy them for that increased move, for that amplification gearing. What's important is you can also go short. What do I mean by go short? Make money in a falling market. You flip the chart. I've done that, been there. <laughs> what are you doing? You sell high, you buy low. So what do you do normally? You buy low and you sell high. Here you sell high and you buy low. So you sell something you don't own. So I borrow your pen and I sell it to someone over there for 10 bucks. And suddenly there's a glut of pens and the price of pens falls to 8 Rand. I buy it back from you for 8 Rand. I return the pen to you and I've made 2 Rand. The point is the process is seamless. I don't have to go and do the borrowing. I just click a button that says, how many do I own? Zero. Well, sell me a 10. So what I've then done is I'm minus 10, and a minus 10% move gives me a plus, because two minuses cancel. I can make money on the downside. So we become directionally agnostic, with one exception, sideways markets. Rising markets, we make money. Falling markets, we lose. A point, and I'm going to come to it in more detail. Falling markets are hard to trade because they're extremely volatile and they're extremely quick. 
Markets go up the stairs and jump out the window. So they really, really speed up on the downside. CFDs are what we call over the counter. In other words, they're not exchange traded, which means we take counterparty risk. What does that mean? If your CFD provider isn't there tomorrow morning, well, you, that's it. If your CFD provider goes bankrupt, you join the queue of people who owed money. In other words, know your counterparty. That Oak you met at a dodgy nightclub and you can't really remember the name of the nightclub, but he said he had a CFD house? Nah. You want someone, you want a, you want a, a, a recognizable brand, you want a balance sheet that is strong, you want someone who can withstand the shocks that may or may not come their way. You want a recognized counterparty. Costs. I'm going to spend a lot of time on costs and future ones, but we need to talk about it. Transaction fees. What are the minimums? What are the costs of gearing? You've borrowed money, right? You bought 25,000 shares, but only paid 5,000. You've borrowed 20,000. So there's interest being charged. Um, what are your costs of your data? Now, I pay 2,000 Rand a year for a data. That's a lot. I mean, you can get it for zero if, you, if you're smart. Does your account have an, an admin fee? They charge you for the privilege of an account. None of these are rocket science, but it's the research we need to do. We need to go and do that digging. We need to say, so what is, you know, because, you know, so 2,000 Rand a year, I mean, it's like, is, is that a big amount? That, that's, that's, that's many cases of wine. And I know that I can get that same chart for free. And I will, as soon as my contract expires in, 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 in January, it's going to be the free stuff because that 2,000 Rand is better to serve my pocket than anybody else's. So interrogate your costs, know what they are. So then some homework because I'm bumping up against time. Two questions to ponder for the next three weeks until we're back on the 11th of August. Why are you trading? What will you trade? I kind of answered the why are you at the beginning. The answer is not money. It is longer term. But in truth, it's about freedom from ties. You had a great phrase. What did you call it? Slipped your mind too. <laughs> yeah. Why are you trading? Yeah. What's the process? And what will you trade? Go back to that list there and interrogate, start to think, go to that process there and say, well, which indices, which FX pairs, why those ones, why not other ones? Start that process. And it's not a, a linear, you, there will be times when we will backtrack, um, contact details coming up in a second, we can engage in that process too. And then things to consider, which we'll go through, consider, ponder around the risks, the strategies, discipline, I've touched on that already, critically important. Knowledge, we need that knowledge. Trading is not rocket science, but like anything else, we have to learn it. The problem is it's almost too easy. So you open your account, you do your fee key, you put 10,000 Rand in, and you think, ha, I are a trader. No, no, you're about to lose 10,000 Rand quickly, painfully, and you probably won't tell your significant other. If you wanted to be a brain surgeon, a plumber, a farmer, anything else, what would you do? You'd go to the library. Ah, okay. You'd go to Google. You think, I know, let's learn some stuff. Let's learn how to do this. Now, in truth, I'm speaking to the converted. You've all given up your Wednesday evening to come into the middle of Santon to learn. But we need to build that knowledge base. Contact, so there the, I'll come to contact these in a second. Next one is 11 August topic. So bookings are open for August, September, October already. Um, they're here. There's webcasts. Videos will be available. There's the link for it. We run this. And if you go, you can find the entire list of what we do every single month. We record if you're unable to make an event. If you're out of town, you can do the webcast. If you're unable to make it, the video is available. So drawdown is when your portfolio is here and then there and there and there and there and there and there and there. So you manage drawdown in, in a couple of ways. Reduced volatility can help, but not by particularly much, uh, by reduced trade size in terms of the process and by reduced gearing. And I'm touching my next session, I talk on to the point I said a moment ago, you put 25,000 into your account. You don't do 25,000 exposure because the drawdown will kill you. You do 10,000 exposure, maybe 15. 
And that automatically doesn't mean you don't get drawdown, but it reduces the level of drawdown. Also, the style that you trade. So a trend-based trader, which I am, drawdown is, 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 is fairly pronounced at times. Just because when it goes sideways, you're in, you lose, you're in, you lose, you're in, and then eventually it breaks. But, you know, my portfolio was in drawdown for six or seven months, my, tra my, my Aussie portfolio, because we just weren't getting a trend. We do come to it in a lot more detail, I think partly session two and then three, which will be September. Ladies and gents, I'll park it there because I have run my time already. Um, contact details for IG, contact details for myself. Happy to answer questions. Welcome to tweet me. Welcome to, to, to email me. Welcome to get hold of the desk here as well. Um, what I can't do and won't do is, you know, tell you, go buy this. Uh, go sell that, et cetera, et cetera. We're talking the, 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 the broader picture from it. I would also, uh, if you've got thoughts, you're welcome to drop me a mail, simon at justonelap.com. Uh, what did work? What didn't work? Are there particular areas you need to, you think we need to focus on? We have planned a 12 month process. Um, we think we've touched everything, but maybe we missed something and, and chop. And then I want to end broadly, slightly where I started. And I want to say two things. The first is this is a process. It is an immensely rewarding process. It's hugely empowering and important if we get to the end and we become a successful trader. I can tell you that it is not anything like in the movies or the TV shows, not even close. That's fine. We don't want the stressful life. We want the relaxed life. That's what we're trying to achieve. I can also tell you that your key requirement for being a trader, you've got to be smart, but mostly you've got to have a heartbeat. This is not, you don't need fancy degrees or, or anything like that. You're going to have to do a lot of work. You're going to have to do effort. There are going to be times when you'd wish you'd never heard the word trading ever mentioned. And it will take time. But eventually, we come out the other side, and that time will be, it, it won't be days, it won't be weeks, it might be months. But one day, we stand back and we think, hey, I sort of maybe kind of am a trader. We never say, I are a trader, because Mr. Market will come and teach you a lesson. But at some point, we start to think that we've got there. And it's within everyone in this room's ability, and everyone on the webcast's ability to be a trader. Because things which we are surprisingly good at as humans will have the capacity for discipline, research, thought process. Things that we do do well are required for trading. There are things we're good at that get in the way, but we will manage those in the process as well. Ladies and gents, we'll leave it there. Please uh, get your parking ticket stamped on the way out below the TV set. Um, I'll see you in three weeks' time. Thank you very much for your time. I hope you learn lots, make tons of money very slowly. Thank you.